it Bill Bailey? Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> My name's Bill Bailey. Have you got a problem with that? No. 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 Hey. <laughs> right, are you ready to sing song? Yes. Yeah, you're really ready, aren't you? <laughs> well, what we'll do, we'll start with a little sing song, right? Uh, just to warm yourselves up. You all know this one. Don't worry, you know the words. Okay? Here we go then. All right? Here we go. <laughs> a karaoke black hole that one isn't it? <laughs> you think you know it you get up and go yeah i know this old cap picture oh better sit down uh, <laughs> yes i found a gap there in your musical knowledge <laughs> don't know it's all of you and there's loads of them every survey there's a few of them isn't there a tiny minority of don't knows 60 percent yes 20 percent no 10 percent don't know <laughs> do you reckon if you add up every survey there's a little militant hardcore of people that don't know anything about anything <laughs> secret meetings. What do we want? Don't know. When do we want it? Not sure. <laughs> Undecided and proud. <laughs> you know, you might in be a don't know and you not know it. <laughs> no? You might be walking along the street and somebody asks you to take part in a survey and they come up with a clipboard and they say something like, um, do you believe in electoral reform? And you might say, well, yes, I do. I believe that proportional representation is an altogether fairer system than the first past the post in that it more accurately reflects the views of the electorate. And they might think, oh, you know your own mind, don't you? <laughs> One last question. Do you prefer chocolate bourbons or custard cream? Uh, chocolate but Hold on a minute. Custard cream? Uh, cho what, what was the first one? Uh, custard They're quite on. Right. Oh, I don't know. Oh, I don't know! <laughs> you might creep up on you like that. Mind you, that I don't have that problem, because uh, if there's some guy with a clipboard in the street doing a survey and he sees me coming towards him, he just says, uh, no, it's all right, mate. <laughs> no, no. It's all right, you know, because he's looking at me like, this bloke's opinions are really going to muck up my pie chart. <laughs> oh, good afternoon. Uh, madam, uh, good afternoon. Sir, did you know that... Uh, oh, excuse me, sir. Uh, can I ask you something? Um, <clears throat> yeah, all right. Uh, how many blue druids <laughs> do you know? Nipper, Big Steve, uh, Martin <laughs> and Alan Lindhurst, the hog, and uh, Neil from the Hand and Flowers, so that's uh, uh, six. Yeah. No, no, it's a new lager, blue druid. It's cold filtered through an old cloak. Right. It's <laughs> a bit of a turn up. <laughs> you know, when I took this job, I thought it'd be a lot easier. <laughs> What do we really know? And where are we going? And when we get there, will there be facilities? <laughs> we used to look to philosophers for these answers. But now, everyone's got their own opinions, even the don't knows. And the philosophers have got to work a bit harder. We exist first. Then we discover the essence of life. And the essence of life is a void between ourselves and the world. Come on now, even thinkers need to eat! <laughs> Come on, Lynn, let's go up the estate. I'm getting nothing up here. But why did you try something a little more punchy, you know, like knowledge is power? You know, a bit of bacon, reel them in a bit. Just drive the trap, Lynn. <laughs> All right, Wally, you know, you're the boss. You see, these days, anyone can be a philosopher, I think, yeah. Anyone that thinks about something to a certain degree and arrives at a useful conclusion can be called a philosopher. 
For example, a woman wrote into Woman's Own, right, which is a uh, cracking read, and, uh, no, brilliant, uh, all the knitting, recipe, oh, brilliant. And uh, she wrote in to suggest that a good way to clean your cheese graters, right, was to uh, uh, hold them out the windows and go up the car wash, like that. <laughs> Now, it works as well. Now, the thing is, that's not up there with Cartesian dualism, is it? But it's a lot handier on a day-to-day -day basis. <laughs> I mean, you compare that, say, with Wittgenstein's theory of solipsism, I mean, that is totally useless. And that's a belter as well. According to that, only I exist. Everything else exists purely in my imagination. I go out the room, you cease to exist. You go out the room, I cease to exist. Now, in reality, he meant it metaphorically, but hypothetically, let's take him literally. <laughs> I don't actually think he had any mates. <laughs> no, I think what was happening was, uh, you know, they were going out of the room, and for them, he did actually cease to exist. <laughs> They're thinking, let's go down to the pub, this place is a nutter. <laughs> but let's give it a practical application, all right? Let's try it in joke form. Three solipsists go into a pub. All right? One of them nips out with some fags, the pub disappears. That's a cheap night, isn't it? <laughs> but how much of you has to go out of the room to qualify for non-existential status? You know? If you bent down to do your shoelaces up like that and your ass went out the door, <laughs> would your ass then cease to exist? <laughs> Would you cease to exist and your ass goes off and have a life of its own? <laughs> I don't know. It's just a theory. All right? But I've got my own theory based partly upon that, and that is the quasi solipsistic post senilis belletomania. And that is, when you go out the room, old people start dancing. <laughs> Uh, now, it's very hard to prove, obviously, because old people are very wily. Uh, or they're like coyotes, you know, big furry ears. <laughs> Good afternoon. Cliff Pocock, 42 Elmbank Lane. Beryl is my wife, thank you. Oh. Now, they do say that a man's got to have a hobby, and mine is fancy rats. My wife says, why don't you just get a couple of long-haired mice and back comb them? <laughs> I said, don't be daft, woman. It's a totally different species. They're lovely little things. That's Roy, after Roy Orbison, you know, lovely voice. <laughs> and that is Lady. I've built a little theatre for him, and when we have people in for dinner, I get them to act out the Homecoming by Harold Pinter. I do the voices, obviously, but they do the little looks. <laughs> What's that doing there? They're all... I actually do think that old people have a secret life. I think when they're talking to you about the traditional old people subjects, you know, uh, Battenberg cake, Val Dunican, the weather, <laughs> they're actually patronising you. Huh? They are. They don't want to be talking about that. They're sitting there going, oh yeah, nippy, isn't it? Ooh, nippy, Battenberg cake. <laughs> and all the time they're thinking, oh my God, I could be at the Bunwell retrospective of the ICA. <laughs> And when you say, oh, Gran, do you want to come for a family outing on Thursday? She might say, oh, no, I'm at my hair done. <laughs> but really, she's thinking, oh, my God, a family outing with you idiots. <laughs> I, that's the afternoon of my talk on German expressionist cinema. <laughs> and she might say, oh, never mind, bye-bye. You go out the door, next minute, Battenberg, in the bin, out with the sun-dried tomatoes, off with the Val Dunigan, on with the Stockhausen. She's singing away, lead off your the young ling <laughs> <laughs> you come back in. Gran, you're singing in German. Am I? Oh, and I'm Gaga. <laughs> <laughs> One of the facts that Clive knows is that the Jaffa cake has got the highest natural buoyancy of any high street biscuit. And that's what got me into my hobby, making boats out of biscuits. In fact, I've just finished a fully working replica of a Viking longship using only a family pack of penguins. <laughs> For the figurehead, I had to use half a lion bar. And I wanted to enter it for the Chill Compton Edible Toy Fair, but dog had it. Who are you talking to? Another one of my theories is that Cockney music has influenced the world's greatest classical composers. <laughs> uh, 
Now, this is true. Over the years, the great classical composers have borrowed heavily from the Cockney canon and woven it into their works. Beethoven, Mozart, have all used this much maligned yet misunderstood genre. And tonight, I'd like to set the record straight. Before I do that, I have to explain to you the basic precepts of Cockney music. Now, you've got your basic Cockney intro. Oh! <laughs> Now, this prefixes all known Cockney music throughout the world. <laughs> There's a slightly longer version. I call it the Pie and Mash intro. Right? That goes like this. Hey! <laughs> Easy now. Now, there's a couple of rare ones. There's the Ava Banana. <laughs> this is quite rare. That's very simple. That's just this. Yeah, have a banana. <laughs> and of course, the full Pearly King intro, as used on big Lord Mayor's dudes, that sort of thing. And that is rather more ostentatious. That is like this. Hey! <laughs> a lot of winking in that one. Now, all of these can be found within the classical repertoire. You just have to know where to look. And I'd like to be your guide tonight. <laughs> so, firstly then, the basic Cockney intro. This can be found in Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata. Now, you've probably heard that a million times, never noticed it before. <laughs> but you have to admit, it is there. Now, the Ava Banana occurs only once in the entire classical repertoire, and that is in the opening to Grieg's Piano Concerto in A minor, as you probably know. Now, for the full Pearly King intro, we have to look to the genius of Mozart, and this can be found in the opening to his classic Meisterwerk, Sonata in C. there from Bach's Prelude number 21 in B flat. No Cockney influence there, I hear you say. But if we listen to that last section again, slow it down, play it slightly differently. <laughs> Oi! <laughs> Cockney intro, first inversion. And thank you. The Cockney section. Are we in monkeys? Are we 
now, as piano films go, we've had Shine uh, and we've had the piano, in which, of course, the piano features largely to the fore. What I think we need, though, we need some action piano films. You know, like this. A man with no identity. A government secret locked inside an old heirloom. Nobody thought that you'd be able to do that with an instrument like that. Arnold Schwarzenegger is the piano tuner. I'm a semitone out! I've never lost a piano! A man with a past. I was the last piano tuner out of Vietnam! Sometimes you have to play the keyboard of your soul to find the strings of your heart and then twist them with a special hammer. Arnold Schwarzenegger, the piano tuner. I'm a little bit flat! The thing is, um, I actually went up for the audition uh, for the part of David Helfgott in Shine. You know, uh, and uh, they said, could you try and uh, play a couple of pieces and try and bring something of yourself uh, to the part? So I said, all right, I'll give it a go. The first one uh, <clears throat> was the scene where he plays the flight of the bumblebee. So I said, all right, I'll give it a go. <coughs> yeah, here we go. This is, this is how it went. Yeah. Didn't go that well, obviously, didn't get the part. But, yeah. <laughs> Dimchurch does it himself. Yeah, I've been doing this place up for a while now, and you tend to get quite caught up in it. I find it very helpful to set all my tools up in the kitchen in case I need to make something to eat. <laughs> for example, a hand roll. You get your roll, stick it in the vice there, and then what you want to do, cut up the middle with a jigsaw. <laughs> nice clean cut. <laughs> See, look at that. Straight to the A1. You release it from the vice, keep the crust away for safety, <laughs> open it up, offer up the ham, like that. Down comes the lid, bang! But look, oh dear, the ham is proud of the roll. No problem, <laughs> back in the vice, crust away for safety, obviously. Just give it a couple of extra turns for luck. Get this sander, there we go. <laughs> and we sand off the excess ham. <laughs> Sand the wind today. And let's have a look at it. Whoa, perfection. Smooth as a baby's bum. All right, you've seen enough of that. Now, what we do now, we take the mastic and seal all around the edge there. Keep it nice and tight. Keep out everything rain, sleet, thunder, wind, and keep the ham nice and dry to a depth of 50 metres. And job done. Look at that. Nothing's getting in there. You could go to the moon with that. That ham would stay fresh as a daisy. But oh no, say you're making a roll for Uncle Frank. He loves mustard. Right, we're going to have to access the ham. Bang. You're no good. Goodbye. Let's have a look. Look at that. Five self tapping screws, two inch, donkey hinge. And we're ready for round two. Ding, ding. The other day, I broke my broom. <laughs> but luckily, I bought it on one of those cover plan schemes, so the company provided me with a rental broom while mine was being fixed. <laughs> but the one they provided me with was a much lighter model than the one I use. I normally use quite a heavy one. This is very light. I started sweeping, whoa, like that. I swept right out into the street and uh, straight into the path of an oncoming steamroller. That's unlucky, isn't it? <laughs> And they, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't replace it because they said I was outside the three main sweeping zones. You know. <laughs> Typical, isn't it? You know, bloody company. 
thing was, what I was doing, I was sweeping up the beard trimmings. Because um, <laughs> I give all my beard trimmings to the Venice Imperial Fund, right? Because six months of beards is enough to uh, fill a small sandbag. <laughs> Right, so I've knocked right out through here. This is as far as I can knock. This is a retaining wall. Beyond that is, of course, the zoo. And uh, I'll be coming up in the capybara house. <laughs> and they'd be, they'd be out like a shot. I'm a little bit unhappy with that colour, though. That is meant to be Gandalf's despair. But it looks to me more like somnolence. Uh, to make the superior use of space, what I've done, I've tunnelled down and out. Right. Well, uh, obviously, still needs a lot of work. The uh, floor's still up. <laughs> but it's come Thursday, they've had the pontoon flooring down. You know, it's on order. Typical, isn't it? <laughs> up there, that'll be the breakfast bar on the mezzanine. Uh, a lot of trunking, trunking, trunking. I'll chase all that out. I want to tile all this uh, when I get the grout. That'll be uh, from Topaz. And uh, through here, I've tunnelled out, and uh, this is going to be the lounge. Uh, stroke day room. And right at the back, will be my trying to end you. Yeah. <laughs> go on, get up. Go on, get up. Go on, get up. Get up, get up. Go on, go on. Change him, change him. Get up. Get up. Go on, get up. I was in this little pub, right? Very small pub, not a big pub at all. Very tiny, tiny, it was actually tiny little, it was a little pixie pub. And uh, I looked in and all the pixies in there playing the pixie pool, playing the pixie darts there, the little pixie shove hate and uh, even little pixie strippers on. Uh, couldn't see much, obviously. Uh, <coughs> get a magnifying glass, can't do that, you burn them. Anyway. <laughs> so, I loomed up at the window, I went, Ooh, like that, and all the pixies went, Ooh. And the pixie stripper went, ooh, like that. And I said, can I have a drink, please? And they said, what do you want, a uh, human pint or pixie pint? I said, human pint, obviously. And they said, we haven't got that much liquid in the building. And I said, come on, lads, I'm desperate. And they said, all right, but it'll cost you. And luckily for me, pixie money is that fluff you get at the bottom of your pocket. Right? <laughs> so uh, I had loads of it. I said, there you go. And they were made instant pixie millionaires. And I had a really clean pocket. <laughs> so we both emerged a winner. And then they struggled around the back of the pub with a huge big vat of pixie lager. And I bent down to pick it up and I brought the tiny vessel up to my lips. And just as I sit like that, I woke up and I was on a park bench in Hammersmith drinking Lambrusco out of an egg cup. <laughs> oh, I tell you, that was a good night. Boy. I was sitting on this bench and this tramp turned to me and he said, uh, excuse me, mate, have you got 20 pence for a four-wheel drive? <laughs> and being a bloke, I said, which one are you getting? <laughs> And he said, I'm torn between a Toyota Land Eater Super Thunder Commander, uh, which is let down by tacky interior styling, but has a rugged design. Either that, or the Nissan Super Jungle Patrol Meister Thunder Captain, I don't know, maybe the Hyundai Super Com Greek Control Thunder Killer Bomber, or maybe I'll go for the upstart pretender to the off-road throne, the Dai Wu Super Land Grabbing uh, uh, Chase Comanche, whoa! Diving Captain Four-Wheel Drive Turbo. I said, well, it's your money. <laughs> I try and do my bit for charity, though. I get them big issue, uh, mail order. Uh, is it a cop out? I don't know. concrete over all of there, all that's going to be hard standing. That way, you don't get any hassle bees and insects. I'll rip all that out, shelving, shelving, shelving. Beautiful ladies in danger, danger all round the world. 
I will protect them because I'm Christopher. <laughs> Beautiful ladies in risky situations <laughs> Beautiful ladies are lovely But sometimes they don't take care They're too busy with their makeup Or combing their lovely hair To take basic safety precautions <laughs> But I will protect them I will save the pretty ones With their smiles and their sparkling eyes but let the ugly ones die. <laughs> I have no place for them in my new world order. I won't waste my seed on hideous trolls. <laughs> You probably heard that a million times, never noticed it before. <laughs> but you have to admit, it is there. Now, the Ava Banana occurs only once in the entire classical repertoire, and that is in the opening to Grieg's Piano Concerto in A minor, as you probably know. For the full Pearly King intro, we have to look to the genius of Mozart, and this can be found in the opening to his classic meisterwork, Sonata in C. prelude number 21 in B flat. No cockney influence there, I hear you say. But if we listen to that last section again, slow it down, play it slightly differently. <laughs> Oi! <laughs> cockney intro, first inversion. And thank you. The Are we in monkeys? Are we monkeys? Are we descended from the deep? Or are we just monkeys in human 
Piano films go. We've had Shine uh, and we've had the piano, in which, of course, the piano features largely to the fore. What I think. I don't have that problem because uh, if there's some guy with a clipboard in the street doing a survey and he sees me coming towards him, he just says, uh, No, it's all right, mate. <laughs> no, no. It's all right, you know, because he's looking at me like, This bloke's opinions are really going to muck up my pie chart. <laughs> oh, good afternoon. Uh, madam, uh, good afternoon. Sir, did you know that. Uh, Oh, excuse me, sir. Uh, can I ask you something? Um, <clears throat> yeah, all right. Uh, how many blue druids <laughs> do you know? <laughs> Nipper, Big Steve, uh, Martin <laughs> and Alan Lindhurst, the hog, and uh, Neil from the Hand of Flowers, so that's uh, uh, six. <laughs> no, no, it's a new lager, blue druid. It's cold filtered through an old cloak. Right. <laughs> oh, it's a bit of a turn up. <laughs> You know, when I took this job, I thought it'd be a lot easier. <laughs> but what do we really know, eh? What do we really know? And where are we going? And when we get there, will there be facilities? <laughs> we used to look to philosophers for these answers. But now, everyone's got their own opinions, even the don't knows. And the philosophers have got to work a bit harder. We exist first. Then we discover the essence of life. And the essence of life is a void between ourselves and the world. Come on now, even thinkers need to eat. <laughs> Come on, Lynn, let's go up the estate. I'm getting nothing up here. But why did you try something a little more punchy, you know, like knowledge is power? You know, a bit of bacon, reel them in a bit. <laughs> All right, Wally. You know you're the boss. <laughs> you see, these days anyone can be a philosopher. I think, yeah. Anyone that thinks about something to a certain degree and arrives at a useful conclusion can be called a philosopher. For example, a woman wrote into Woman's Own, right, which is a uh, cracking read. And, uh, no, brilliant. Uh, all the missing recipe. Oh, brilliant. And, uh, she wrote in to suggest that a good way to clean your cheese graters, right, was to, uh, uh, hold them out the windows and go up the car wash. Like that. <laughs> now, it works as well. Now, the thing is, that's not up there with Cartesian dualism, is it? But it's a lot handier on a day to day basis. <laughs> I mean, you compare that, say, with Wittgenstein's theory of solipsism. I mean, that is totally useless. And that's a belter as well. According to that, only I exist. Everything else exists purely in my imagination. I go out the room, you cease to exist. You go out the room, I cease to exist. Now, in reality, he meant it metaphorically. But hypothetically, let's take him literally. Rockhausen, <laughs> she's singing away. Lead off your the young come back in. Grand, you're singing in German. Am I? Oh, I'm on Gaga. <laughs> <laughs> One of the facts that Clive knows is that the Java cake has got the highest natural buoyancy of any high street biscuit. And that's what got me into my hobby, making boats out of biscuits. In fact, I've just finished a fully working replica of a Viking longship using only a family bag of penguins. <laughs> right. For the figurehead, I had to use half a lion bar. And I wanted to enter it for the Chill Compton Edible Toy Fair, but dog had it. <laughs> what are you talking to? <laughs> Another one of my theories is that Cockney music has influenced the world's greatest classical composers. Uh, now, this is true. Over the years, the great classical composers have borrowed heavily from the Cockney canon and woven it into their works. Beethoven, Mozart, have all used this much maligned yet misunderstood genre. And tonight, I'd like to set the record straight. Before I do that, I have to explain to you the basic precepts of Cockney music. Now, you've got your basic Cockney intro. Oh! <laughs> right. 
Now, this prefixes all known Cockney music throughout the world. <laughs> There's a slightly longer version. I call it the Pie and Mash intro. Right? That goes like this. Hey! <laughs> Easy now. Now, there's a couple of rare ones. There's the Ava Banana. <laughs> this is quite rare. That's very simple. That's just this. The Ava Banana. <laughs> and of course, the full Pearly King intro, as used on big Lord Mayor's dudes, that sort of thing. And that is rather more ostentatious. That is like this. A lot of winking in that one. <laughs> now, all of these can be found within the classical repertoire. You just have to know where to look. And I'd like to be your guide tonight. <laughs> so, firstly then, the basic Cockney intro. This can be found in Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata. Bill Bailey. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> My name's Bill Bailey. Have you got a problem with that? No. no. Hey. Right, you ready for a sing song? Yes. Yeah, hey, you're really ready, aren't you? <laughs> well, what we'll do, we'll start with a little sing song, right? Uh, just to warm yourselves up. You all know this one. Don't worry, you know the words. Okay? Here we go then. All right? Here we go. <laughs> a karaoke black hole, that one, isn't it? <laughs> you think you know it, you get up and go, yeah, I know this old cap, pizza hole, better sit down. Uh, <laughs> yes, I found a gap there in your musical knowledge. <laughs> Don't know, there's all of you. And there's loads of them. Every survey, there's a few of them, isn't there? A tiny minority of don't knows. 60% yes, 20% no, 10% oh, don't know. <laughs> Do you if you add up every survey, there's a little militant hardcore of people that don't know anything about anything? <laughs> secret meetings. What do we want? Don't know. When do we want it? Not sure. <laughs> Undecided and proud. <laughs> no, you might even be a don't know and you not know it. <laughs> no? You might be walking along the street and somebody asks you to take part in a survey and they come up with a clipboard and they say something like, um, do you believe in electoral reform? And you might say, well, yes, I do. I believe that proportional representation is an altogether fairer system than the first past the post in that it more accurately reflects the views of the electorate. And they might think, oh, you know your own mind, don't you? <laughs> One last question. Do you prefer chocolate bourbons or custard cream? Uh, chocolate but Hold on a minute. Custard cream. Uh, cho what was the first one? Uh, custard. They're quite nice. Right. Oh, I don't know. Oh, I don't know! <laughs> it might creep up on you like that. Mind you that, I don't... <laughs> I don't actually think you have any mates. <laughs> no, 
I think what was happening was, uh, you know, they were going out of the room, and for them, he did actually cease to exist. <laughs> They're thinking, let's go down the pub, this place is nutter. <laughs> but let's give it a practical application, all right? Let's try it in joke form. Three solipsists go into a pub, all right? One of them nips out with some fags, the pub disappears. That's a cheap night, isn't it? <laughs> But how much of you has to go out of the room to qualify for non-existential status, you know? If you bent down to do your shoelaces up like that, and your arse went out the door... <laughs> would your arse then cease to exist? Or would you cease to exist, and your arse goes off and have a life of its own? I don't know. It's just a theory. All right? But I've got my own theory, based partly upon that. And that is the quasi-solipsistic post-senilis bellettomania. And that is, when you go out the room, old people start dancing. <laughs> right. Now, it's very hard to prove, obviously, because old people are very wily. Yeah. Or oh, they're like coyotes, you know, big furry ears. <laughs> Good afternoon. Cliff Pocock, 42 Elmbank Lane. Beryl is my wife, thank you. Oh. Now, they do say that a man's got to have a hobby, and mine is fancy rats. My wife says, why don't you just get a couple of long-haired mice and bat comb them? <laughs> I said, don't be daft, woman. It's a totally different species. They're lovely little things. That's Roy, after Roy Orbison, you know, lovely voice. <laughs> and that is Lady. I've built a little theatre for him, and when we have people in for dinner, I get them to act out the homecoming by Harold Pinter. I do the voices, obviously, but they do the little looks. <laughs> What's that doing there? They're all... I actually do think that old people have a secret life. I think when they're talking to you about the traditional old people subjects, you know, uh, Battenberg cake, Val Dunican, the weather, <laughs> they're actually patronising you. Huh? They are. They don't want to be talking about that. They're sitting there going, oh, yeah, nippy, isn't it? Ooh, nippy, butter cake. Ooh. And all the time they're thinking, oh, my God, I could be at the Bunwell retrospective of the ICA. <laughs> <laughs> and when you say, oh, Gran, do you want to come for a family outing on Thursday? She might say, oh, no, I'm at my hair done. <laughs> but really, she's thinking, oh, my God, a family outing with you, idiots. <laughs> That's the afternoon of my talk on German expressionist cinema. <laughs> and she might say, oh, never mind, bye-bye. You go out the door, next minute, Battenberg, in the bin, out with the sun-dried tomatoes, off with the Val Dunigan, on with the story.